Abortion happens every day. Millions of people around the world will have an abortion each year. But the majority of those people will never talk about their abortion experiences. What if millions of people broke their silence and told the truth about their lives and their choices? This is Melissa Madera in Granville, Ohio, and you're listening to the Abortion Diary Podcast. These are the stories we share. I thought for the past 10 years that I couldn't get pregnant, or at least that if I was going to get pregnant, it was going to be really hard to do so um, because I have fertility issues. Um, and part of those fertility issues caused me to, well, not cause, but the doctor prescribed birth control as a way to keep my hormones in, in the right levels. And so in addition to having fertility issues, I'm also on birth control. So I never had any concerns at all about um, getting pregnant anyway. And um, finally around, I guess I was 29, and I decided to go ahead and get everything tested and see what my chances are of having kids because I'm, you know, getting close to 30 years old and I'm thinking I need to know what my chances are. Do I need to freeze eggs? Do I need to, like, what do I need to do? Um, so there's a there's a um, gynecologist here in town, ACRM is the place, and they basically help people have babies. So I went over there and um, in order to check all my hormone levels on I guess my normal hormone levels, I had to be off the birth control. So I went off the birth birth control for a few months um, just so everything would go back to like its normal state. And um, I did all this testing. Um, They did ultrasounds, looked at my ovaries and all this kind of stuff. And she said, actually, your issue is that you have a ton of eggs because they never actually come out. (laughs) Your ovaries never release eggs. And um, so you don't really need to worry about freezing any of them. And you probably, you might, you know, we might have to have you take some medication to have an egg released or something like that, but um, you should be fine. You should be able to have kids. And that was good news. I, I wasn't expecting that because the gynecologist I had been seeing for the past 10 years had said, you might have trouble. You probably will have trouble. And um, my aunt certainly did. She wasn't able to have kids. And she and I and my mom, we all have sort of a lot of the same issues. So... Imagine my surprise when I went in to get one of the tests done and the doctor said, well, you should be having your period in two weeks based on the levels that you're at right now. So as soon as you do come in, we'll do another test. But I never got my period, which is not that abnormal. So I called in and I said, well, I haven't got my period yet. Let's reschedule for when I do. And she says, well, you need to take a pregnancy test. (laughs) And I I was pregnant, which... (laughs) I was so happy. The guy I was dating at the time, Joe, we had been dating for about a year. And um, I met him when I moved to Atlanta. And we had been dating for about a year. And I was thinking about breaking up with him, actually. Not because he's a bad guy. Just I just didn't really think that we fit. Like, we just weren't a good fit. I cared a lot about him, though, so I stayed with him for probably longer than I would have normally. Um, but then I found out I was pregnant, and that was um, July 18th, which is my mom's birthday, when I found out. And um, it was late. It was like a Thursday night or something. And uh, so I texted my mom a picture of the little dipstick, whatever, that you... <laughs> and she was mad that I didn't call and tell her, but I actually thought, you know, the picture might be like a funny way to tell her. Um, Joe was pretty upset. He's like, you know, this is not the way that I pictured it going. And I feel like men really have the option of making those kinds of choices sometimes. You know, he could have kids until he's 80 if he wants to. You know, so he has this idea of the way he wants things to go. You know, fall in love, get engaged, get married, then have kids. You know, and somewhere in there you buy a house, buy a car. You know, like the the way things are supposed to go, so to speak. And so he was really more upset about that. He's like, this is not the way I wanted this to happen. And I think, you know, to a certain degree, he was feeling a little bit of what I was feeling was that maybe this isn't going to work out between us anyway. Um, So then I told my roommate, Jack, and I had spoken to you about Jack before, but um, I've known Jack since undergrad. I've known him for over 10 years now. And um, 
we had been living together for about two years in Atlanta. When I moved to Atlanta, he was the only person that I knew. And I've made a lot of friends since then, but Jack has always been there for me. So I told Jack, of course. And um, I was like, you know, how do you feel about living with a baby? <laughs> because I didn't know what my situation was going to be. But Joe came around. I mean, after he got over the initial shock of the way his life was changing in such a huge way, he was fully on board. And he was so supportive. And I was exhausted. I mean, I was just exhausted. Because I was considered sort of high risk, I had to be on a special medication while I was pregnant. And that medication made me sick. So it wasn't really having morning sickness. I was really just sick from the medication. But then I was just tired all the time. And everything they say about smells and being sensitive with smells, that's really true. Everything smells bad. <laughs> everything makes you want to puke. It's like, why are there so many gross things out there? <laughs> But um, for me, despite all the discomfort, it was more than I could hope for because I've, I've always wanted kids. I love kids. And I was so happy that I could have them. I was just so grateful. Um, and it didn't really matter to me that, you know, Joe and I were about to break up before this happened because he's a good guy. I think he'll be a great father. And I know that he'll be a good partner and a good provider and all that kind of stuff. And I really counted myself lucky. Um, and I remember laying in bed one day. Um, my and Jack's lease was up. So we, um, I told him, I said, I just really can't afford where we're living. And especially with a baby coming, I don't, I really can't afford this. So we moved um, to another place that was a little bit cheaper. And I remember laying in bed one day shortly after the move. And I felt him. <laughs> And it felt like feathers like tickling because he wasn't that big yet. And I, it was just, it's a moment I'll never forget. About a month after that, Joe asked me to move in with him. Um, I had originally told him I wasn't going to move in with him. I told him, you know, maybe by the end of the year, because we got, I guess we conceived at the end of June. And I moved in with Jack in September, um, actually the end of August. And I told Joe I wouldn't move in with him until after the year was up. If, cause you know, the, the first three months, that's the most common time for, to have a miscarriage and all that. And um, I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket, so to speak. I didn't want to move in with him, especially like we weren't really sure what our relationship status should be and all that. And um, I wasn't going to move in with him if there was even the slightest possibility that the baby wouldn't make it or something like that. The pregnancy wouldn't work out. Um, but he was just so sweet about it. He was so sweet. Um, my dad called like every other day saying we should get married. And uh, my grandfather felt the same way. My grandfather is very old school. He's Turkish and he's so proper and so strict about things like having babies out of wedlock. <laughs> so... You know, I got these calls all the time and he was just so supportive. And he and I were on the same page in that if we were going to get married, it was going to be because we loved each other and not because of a kid. Not that we weren't thinking of the kid, but we just thought that we're not doing a child any favors by marrying someone we don't love. Um, so we held out and he was really supportive about it. He was always on my side and he always defended me. Um, then one day he asked me to move in with him and he said, I just, I want to be there for all the little things. Like I want to be there as you grow. And I want to be there the first time that you feel the baby. And I want to be there. And I want to be a part of that. And I couldn't deny him that. So in, at the end of September, I moved in with him. Um, and then he proposed right after that. And so we got engaged. And then a couple of weeks later, my mom was in town. And... Um, Around the time we got engaged, I had gone to the doctor and the gynecologist said that there seemed to be an issue. The baby's bladder was too big. And she said it could be an issue later on down the line, but in most cases, it resolves itself. Um, my mom came into town a couple weeks later and she wanted to see the baby. She's you know, another state away. So I never get to see her. 
and all I had been able to send her were pictures of the ultrasound pictures. <laughs> so she wanted to see the baby. So we went to one of these places where um, they do the ultrasound and they can tell you the sex of the baby. And I was far enough along that there's like a period of time. There's a, a specific week that you have to be pregnant that they can tell when what the sex of the baby is. And um, so we went to one of these places. And Joe was really anxious because I had told him about the bladder being too big. The doctor said that we would have to wait four weeks, though, before they could really make a diagnosis. Um, and this was right in between. We were two weeks from that first appointment and two weeks from the next appointment. And um, they put, they set me up on the table and they put the thing on my belly and the picture popped up. And the first thing we saw was that the bladder was huge. It was bigger than his head even. It was pretty extreme. And uh, Joe says, fuck, that's the first thing he said. Um, the ultrasound techs aren't allowed to tell you anything medical. The only thing that they can tell you is what sex the baby is. And um, so she said, you know, like off the record, like I can't say anything to you, but I think that you guys already know. So we went to the doctor a few weeks later and um, Joe and I were pretty prepared at this point. We had done a lot of research and the doctor only confirmed what we knew was that um, the bladder issue had obviously not resolved itself and that it was life-threatening. Um, we had done a lot of research about it. Basically, basically the little tube that goes from the bladder into the urethra didn't form. And the way the baby forms is, and I didn't know this before, but they swallow the amniotic fluid and they also breathe it in and the amniotic fluid helps the lungs to form. And when they swallow it, it goes all the way through their system and they, for lack of a better word, pee it out. And um, that amniotic fluid also cushions them in the womb. And if they're swallowing it and it's going into their bladder, but there's no way for it to go out, it's staying in the bladder. And that's why the bladder was so big. Which also means that there's no amniotic fluid for the baby to swallow. I mean, for the baby to breathe in and there's none to pad him. If there's no amniotic fluid for him to be breathing in or not enough, then his lungs aren't going to form properly. And if there's not enough around the baby, then he ends up with physical deformations like club feet and things like that. Um, which could theoretically be fixed during surgery, but maybe not. Um, the other issue is you've got nine months of a baby swallowing amniotic fluid and it's all in his bladder. So there's always the possibility that the bladder bursts. And what was already evident at our 14 week checkup was that he also had kidney damage and he would need a kidney transplant if he even made it to term and that he would need um, dialysis probably his whole life. And I just, I had a three-year-old niece at the time, and I just pictured her on dialysis, and I, I couldn't do that to a kid, knowingly do that to a child. And the only way that even would have been a possibility is if they had done a surgery in utero, wherein they would go in and, and try to make that tube connect so that the amniotic fluid could drain from the bladder out. Um... But that could kill the baby and it could sterilize me. So there's not even the chance at that. And and I would have to wait like another month. Like the baby wasn't even big enough for me. So he's already got severe kidney damage, which is not usual at this point. Like his was progressing and it was so much worse than most babies at this juncture. So it was already a pretty severe case. And I couldn't see waiting another month. I couldn't see doing all of that and even if he lived he would still need all this medical care joe and i did all this research on the medical stuff but we also looked at um people have written about their experiences we looked at their accounts and people said things like i'm so glad that i went through with the surgery and that i brought this child to term i would 
never have been able to meet my little guy. And um, he's so happy. He's such a fighter, even through all the pain, etc. Well, that's all he knew. Like, that's all he ever knew. So he, he wouldn't know a pain-free life. So, of course, he's happy and all that. Like, that's, that's all he's known. And I, I felt like that was kind of sick. I didn't feel comfortable with that. So, as his parents, Cho and I made the decision to terminate the pregnancy. So, the first weekend in October, we went to... Um, I think it was the feminist women's clinic. My um, my OBGYN, she was at Emory, and it was going to cost like three thousand dollars or something at Emory. Insurance wasn't going to cover it because it wasn't health of the child, it wasn't health of the mother. It was elective, and I didn't have three thousand dollars sitting around. Whereas feminist women clinic clinic was only going to charge nine hundred. And this is in addition to the 900 I paid to have the genetics checked out. Because if this was a genetic issue, um, I mean, it was. It was a genetic birth defect, but was it something that was in our genes? Like, was it going to happen again? That's something Joe and I needed to know. Um, or was it just an anomaly? And so that's... <sighs> It was really strange, actually. I know I'm kind of going out of order in time, but the day that they told us it's too severe and we elected to terminate, they um, they said they needed to take fluid from the amniotic sac. And so I had to like lay on a table and they had this huge needle that they poked into me like I'm just laying there and they're poking a needle in there to take the fluid out. And I had to sign all these forms, all these waivers and stuff. And they're like, well, the reason you have to sign this is because it could cause a miscarriage. And then as the doctor said that, she kind of shrugs because she's like, well, I mean, I know you're about to terminate anyway, but just so you know, it could cause a miscarriage. And anyway, so uh, um, later on that week, we went to, like I said, the first week of October, we went to um, the Feminist Women, Women's Clinic. It was really cold that morning. I just remember it was so cold. We were all bundled up and um, it was a weird building. It looked like it was really empty from the front and I knew I was like I know I'm not the only person getting an abortion on a Saturday morning like where is everybody I look across the street there's all these people protesting and I'm like who does that like it's it's a Saturday morning in October there's so much fun stuff going on in town you have nothing better to do than to come over here and make people's lives difficult so we went around to the other side of the building and that's where we saw the cars all right we're in the right place there's a guard at the door, like an actual security guard. This guy's big and he needs our ID. He like almost didn't even let Joe in. I was like, I need him to be with me for this. <laughs> it was really strange. I couldn't believe how much so, uh, security that there was. And they wouldn't let us have our phones. We couldn't bring our phones into the building at all, which was kind of strange. Um, but I had come prepared. I had books. Um, so we went in. We had this giant waiting room full of people um they had a tv on everybody's kind of watching the tv i forget what movie it was but it's a good distraction i mean if you're about to do what you're about to do then it's um you kind of need something to take your mind off it and if it's a silly movie it's really loud and it's taking up everyone's attention you get your mind off of it and you don't feel the need to make small talk with the person next to you which is kind of awkward too um, since ours, our termination was, was, um, like a medical termination, it was supposed to be like for medical reasons, so to speak. Um, it was weird. They treated us a lot different. They didn't make us wait in the waiting room. They actually had like another room in the back where they let us wait in privacy, just the two of us. And they ended up letting us bring our phones in and everything. And I, I thought that was a little bit strange that, um, because it wasn't exactly medical necessity, but we weren't terminating the pregnancy because it was inconvenient or for pride or for like family reasons or 
financial reasons. It was because the baby had a birth defect. And that somehow set us apart from the like 30 or 40 other women that were sitting in that room. But it's also really comforting to not be around so many other people when I was making such a private decision. And um, I, enjoy, I, you know, I appreciated the quiet. I appreciated the privacy that we had. So we were sitting in the room. Joe and I started looking at a calendar. There's a lot of fun stuff that goes on in Atlanta in October. So we sat down and started making a calendar of all the fun stuff that we were going to do in October. So it was really made it a lot easier to look forward to plans. And um, so in the midst of all this, the nurse comes in and, and gives me a couple of pills. And she says, take this. It'll um, relax your cervix. So I, I took the medicine and, and that's exactly what it did. It like opens up your cervix and I can feel everything loosening up. And it just killed me to know that my son was in there and I was about to be letting him go, putting him in somebody else's hands. I felt like a murderer. It was <laughs> letting him be killed. <laughs> I just hope that, I, because I don't know if he's in pain in there, and I don't know, I don't think there's any consciousness on his part, and I don't know that I believe that he necessarily had a soul at that point or not, like, I just don't know where I am in my religious beliefs, but I hope that if somehow he's conscious or becomes conscious of it, that he understands that I was trying to save him the pain later. But it just felt so wrong to be putting him in danger, so to speak. And so that was really difficult. And I remember, um, thinking it was weird to be doing it voluntarily like that. So the time came eventually, everything was all loosened up and ready to go, so to speak. And, um... The nurse brought me back and they said Joe couldn't come. It was just me. And that was really hard walking down the hall alone. And they put me on a table and there were nurses in there and the um, anesthesiologist. It was very, I don't know. She didn't have very many words. She just walked straight in. She's very frank up front. She was like, I'm here to put you under. No, hello. How are you doing? Like nothing like that. And I had already had the, um, I forget what they call them. Um, they put something in your vein, like a little plastic piece to hold the vein open, and it makes it much easier to put the needle in and put the medicine in um, if they just have it open all the time. So I already had that in there. And they were, so she just like, as she was saying, all right, I'm here to put you under, she's already coming at me with the needle. And I'm terrified of needles. So this is already like, I'm already in a bad place. And she's coming at me with the needle. Joe's not here, so I'm kind of freaking out. And I'm a very strong person, but at this point, I lost it. Like, I just started bawling. And that's the last thing I remember, is I was just laying on this table, looking up at the ceiling, bawling. And then I was out. And it felt like I woke up a minute later, and I was in another room. Um, turns out it had only been like five minutes. I didn't realize that it would take such little time. And I woke up, and um, they gave me some water shortly after Joe came in. I got dressed and I was out of there. So it was like two hours waiting just to have the thing done. And then I get into the room and from that time until I walked out, it was like maybe 15, 20 minutes. It was really strange. It was so fast. And I spent the rest of the day being really woozy and um, lightheaded and stuff, I guess, from the drugs and being under. And Joe took really good care of me. I was really appreciative. They said that I couldn't have sex for two weeks. The first time we had sex, like exactly two weeks later, I got um, I got a bladder infection. It's like seriously, <laughs> you know. Two days after the surgery, though, so that was on a Saturday. I started having some tenderness in my breast, and then on Monday, 
it was so painful. I had to go home from work because um, my milk had come in because I was in the second trimester. And that's apparently a thing that happens. And I was so angry. It's bad enough that there's no baby to feed. But I mean, it's also physically painful. Like I had just started this new job the month prior. I had to miss work to have this abortion. <laughs> and now I'm missing work because I'm I'm milking, like I'm lactating. And that was a really, really weird thing. Um, I don't know, maybe other people don't think it's weird, but I think it's really weird to have milk coming out of you. And um, I had no idea how painful it would be. But I mean, you're completely filled up and you're completely swollen and you're not allowed to express any of the milk because if you do, you'll just keep expressing milk. And I called the doctor and they were like, oh, just put catheter tubes on it. I was like, there's no way that's medical science. You t- Give me a pill like that makes the milk go away. And so I called my OBGYN over at Emory and she's like, yep, that's what you do. You put cabbage leaves. I'm like, so you want me to walk around with like lettuce on my boobs? That's a thing. That's what you're telling me to do. But I'm going through this extremely painful process, like physically and emotionally. <laughs> yep, that's that's the that's the advice. It works pretty well, but I have to say, um, walking around with cabbage on your boobs all day isn't, um, it's not all that comfortable. It's wet, it makes all these wrinkles on you, and it smells like fart. It's just a constant fart, like, right there under your nose. And I'm just walking around my apartment all day. I'm like, I've got nothing else better to do because I can't go to work like this. The only thing that there is to do is sit here and think about, in addition to not having a baby right now, I am... I am walking around with milk for it. I'm not explaining it very well, but it was like adding insult to injury. The injury being, I don't have this child. I had to give up this child. And then the insult, like on top of that, we're going to, you're going to have milk now and you've got no one to feed. Just this constant reminder like, can it just be over now? Can it just be over? Why do I have to keep dealing with it? And why is why is my body not gotten the memo? Why does it not know that, that there's no one there? <laughs> and like I said, I just started this job, so it's not like anybody at work knew. I showed up to work one week and I'm pregnant, and the very next week I'm not pregnant. And that was a really weird sensation too. And I was in this like awkward stage where I was kind of wearing maternity pants and um, my clothes weren't fitting anymore. But then once, once we terminated the pregnancy, it was, um, my clothes didn't fit still. (laughs) But I didn't want to wear maternity pants because it was just another reminder. So wearing clothes was awkward too. And I couldn't lose weight for like another couple of months. I mean, I couldn't even lose a pound. So again, I just felt like my body was betraying me. Why can't everything go back to normal now? There's nothing in there anymore. So that was pretty difficult. Um, By around January, I started to feel better. It started to feel normal again. Um... I still haven't had normal periods since then, which I think is really strange. Um, I kind of went into a little cave. I stopped going out. I stopped seeing people. So in January, right around the time my body started feeling normal again, I started seeing people again. It was comforting, but I just, I still have never felt the same. Like I'm out with everybody and it's like I'm just there. I'm not really part of anything. It just doesn't make sense, but it's, that's how I felt being out with people I was so ready to be a mom and to have a family and I got so into that mindset and then abruptly everything was different and it was I couldn't go back to normal I felt like I couldn't go back to normal after that I remember talking to um, Joe's sister about it. Uh, she had had a, an abortion before, 
she had a um cancerous lesion on her cervix and so she had to have an abortion sometime i think it was in april we found out she was pregnant again we weren't supposed to know but um we found out she was pregnant again and then um about a month or two later she had an abortion it just wasn't convenient for her that really upset me it's obviously her choice and if she felt like she didn't have the lifestyle that she could support a child in and she's making the decision that's right for her and for her child it just didn't seem very fair a lot of people in my life assumed that I had a miscarriage even though I was in the second trimester I wasn't so far along that that's not possible, you know. I think having an abortion is so much harder. It's one thing if your body makes the decision for you and you don't have any choice in it. It's a whole other thing altogether to drive over there and walk into the clinic and put yourself on that table. I have not once looked back, though, and thought that I made the wrong decision. I felt like I felt like it was the right decision to save him the pain. Not to mention the expense I expect. But I still miss him and I really wish that I had met him. <laughs> It's hard walking around. There's so many pregnant people. <laughs> you really don't think about it if you're seeing them. But um, especially at my age, all my friends are having kids. There were these two women in my office, actually, who were a couple of doors down from me in my office, um, who were pregnant at the same time I was. One woman was expecting her child in March just like I was and that was extremely difficult to have her right down the hall and her pregnancy was going fine in February the office had a baby shower for her and people kept coming up to me and saying oh are you gonna be there are you coming and I don't have an excuse to give, not that it's any of their business, like, I have to give an excuse, but I was like, no. <laughs> like, what else do you say? So that was really difficult. I tried to be out of the office as much as I could, um, so I didn't have to see her, so I didn't have to have people asking me. Um, in early February, I had to drive out to one of the jails um, for a client meeting, and on the way over there, I was just thinking about the baby shower that was supposed to be happening later that afternoon and how that's supposed to be me. I'm supposed to be doing that right now. I should be celebrating. And I was so distracted that I ran off the road and I hit a tree and fell into a culvert and totaled my car. And I broke my hand. When they pulled the car out of the ditch, they had to get this giant crane, actually, to get the car out. And I'm thinking, I'm really lucky to be alive. That car is in bad shape. <laughs> and all I came out with was um, some pretty bad bruises and a broken hand, but that's it. In the weeks following, um, I couldn't do anything for myself. I couldn't even put my own seatbelt on. I was in so much pain. And Joe took care of me through all of that. And he was there every, everything I needed. And it was so comforting. And I thought, I wouldn't have been through any of this if I hadn't gone through the pregnancy, gone through the termination. I, Joe and I would have been broken up. I never would have experienced any of, the, any of this. But to have somebody to be so kind and so gentle and so giving, I just fell even more in love with him. And I thought to myself, man, 
I would have missed all this. So I started to see some silver lining to all of it. Um, I had really long hair. My Joe was fixing my hair every morning. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you've ever had a a man who's had straight hair his whole life have to fix your hair, but it is uh, <laughs> it was funny, I guess I could say, at first. Um, he got much better at it by the week's end. But I thought, man, I just can't do this for six weeks. So I chopped it all off, which is why I have really short hair now. Um, and I've loved my short haircut since then. Everybody calls it a pixie cut. I guess that's what it is. Um, but it was the sweetest part of my morning, every morning, to have Joe fix my hair. Sometime in April, um, I think that we finally realized the differences that we felt were there. Almost exactly a year prior, we're still there. And so we decided to break up. Um, for 10 years thinking you're not going to get preg pregnant. And then you get pregnant. And then you have to terminate. Like not even like you just have a miscarriage. But you have to like walk into a place. And get an abortion. I felt like the rug had just been pulled out from under me. And it was so comforting to have Joe there. Still in my life. And then to have that taken away from me again, I had a lot of ups and downs this year. And um, it wasn't just losing Joe, which has been extremely difficult, but it's losing the ability, to, the ability to have kids. You know, I can't do it myself. I need a man, some man. <laughs> and to um, have someone you love and care about so much who's willing to um, start a family and do all that stuff with you and then. All of a sudden, you don't have it. So I felt even more empty than before. It's been a tough year. I moved into this place. Um, it was a three-bedroom place. There were two other girls living there. And me and this other girl were subletting from the main girl. We'll call her Susan. I was there for like two and a half weeks. Um, until I realized Susan was crazy. <laughs> And so me and the other girl both agreed that we couldn't live there any longer. She had already been there for about three months. Um, so I said to her, I don't think I can live here anymore. I got to get out of here. It was a difficult decision to make. Joe actually helped me move in. I mean, he and two of my other friends moved all my stuff. He rented a truck for me. He spent all day helping me pack, moving my things, putting my furniture back together. And then two and a half weeks later, I'm like, I just... I got to get out of here. And Joe said, I'll help you again. I'll rent you another truck. Anything that you need. Anything. Anything. But I told this other girl, I was like, I just, I got to go. And she's, you can't leave me here. You have to take me with you. <laughs> she had been there for three months and she'd been putting up with it. And wow. So she and I found a place together. And that's where we are sitting right now. This is the new place we just moved in a couple weeks ago. And it's been going really well. Susan was very unhappy about it. <laughs> she was very angry. <laughs> uh, but she found a new roommate. I hope it works out for her. I mean, she's a cool girl. They just uh, didn't get along as roommates, you know. That stuff happened. But here we are at the end of June, beginning of July. Um, I was, I had just conceived exactly a year ago. We've just passed Father's Day. I've just broken up with who was supposed to be the father of my kid. And um, it's hard not to feel his presence all the time. <laughs> but I'm hoping that, that this is the time now where things start to calm down. I have this new place. I've got great roommates. Thankfully, Mother's Day's passed, Father's Day's passed. Those have been some very difficult holidays for me. And it's been two months since the breakup, so I think I'm finally getting to a place where I'm more at peace about it. And funny enough, Joe's been really great through all the breakup. I think this has been the healthiest, most civil breakup I've ever been through. 
we're not angry with each other. We don't hate each other. We help each other if we need it. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but yeah, that's the whole story. Lots of details. Probably had nothing to do with an abortion, but there's a lot that led up to it. And a lot that's come from it. It's been a long time since I said the whole story, so I apologize. It's really emotional. When we've gone to support groups, it's been much of the same message. Okay. <laughs> How did it go going to support groups? First, we went to group counseling, just Joe and I. We went. And um, that was really helpful. Um, I was an engineer before, and I'm a lawyer now, and I feel like there should be a method to grief. grief like, Okay, tell me a thing to do. I'll work on that, and then I'll make some linear progress, and at the end of it, I won't feel this anymore. And it has disappointingly not been like that at all. <laughs> Grief doesn't work like that. We finally got to a place where um, I felt like, I mean, Joe, not to say he's like over it in a minute, but he got over it pretty quick, for lack of a better way of describing it, is, is he got past it. But he also didn't carry him. He didn't feel him. This is not something that he's ached for in his soul, like ached for a family. This is not something. So for me, it was a lot harder. So we got to a place um, through the grief counseling where I felt like I was ready to talk with other people about it. So we went to a group specifically for um, women who lost babies, whether it was by miscarriage, abortion, or, you know, post-birth, like they had, the child had been born, stillborn, or whatever. So, um, we went and we were the only couple who hadn't named him. For me, naming him meant not that he wasn't real to me, but it was so much more concrete if you put a name on it, on what happened. And I felt like if I gave him a name, that that name would forever have carried this, it would have negative feelings for me. Every time I met somebody with that name, I would always think about it. And I, I already had enough triggers happening. And the problem with grief is you don't know what your triggers are. You try to identify them. You hang out with pregnant lady number one and you're fine. But pregnant lady number two, all of a sudden, you're in tears. And there's just no way to figure out ahead of time how it's going to happen. There's no way to prevent it. So um, so I felt like naming him would just be another trigger. Um, so it almost made me feel like I wasn't doing it right. Even though with grief, there's no right or wrong way of doing things, but I felt almost like I was missing something. Um, but we didn't name him. It was really helpful, though, to, to listen to um, the wisdom that other people had garnered from their experiences. And it was um, it was really heartbreaking to hear other people's stories. That was, um, it made me feel pretty sad that other people had experienced what I experienced on some level. There was only other one other couple there that had been through specifically what we had been through in that they had chosen to terminate the pregnancy because of a birth defect. And um, she had something really fun to say about it that I had carried with me. She said, um, if you ever do decide to name him, you can name him whatever you want. No one's going to say anything <laughs> if you name him something weird because it's a dead child. Like, who's going to say anything, right? I was like, that's actually pretty funny and that's pretty cool. That's true. But the other piece of wisdom that, that she gave me, and I'm so grateful that I met her, was, um, you know, if you don't actually have a baby, People don't really think of you as parents, you know, because um, you're not parenting anyone. But the fact of the matter was that I was a mom. And most parents have to make, well, every parent has to make a decision for their child at some point. And I did. I was the best mom for my son. I was the best mom that it could have been for this particular child. 
And so I was as much a blessing to him to make that decision for him as he was for me to give me the hope and knowledge that I could get pregnant and from bringing me closer to Joe. And that made me really feel good to know that, yeah, I was the best mom that I could be for him at the time. And Joe said it too, you know, he said, the best thing that you could have given him was mercy and you gave him that. So it's a small comfort, yes. But it was something that I had not thought of before. And um, so going to the support group and hearing things like that really helped my healing process. It also made me feel better to know that I wasn't the only person to really withdraw from everyone. And then when I felt ready to go back into my social groups and all that to still not feel the same and know that it can never be the way that it was before. And I don't know why it can't ever be the same, but it just can't. You're a different person. This is part of who you are now. It changes you. And you'll it'll never be the same. And everyone else there had that experience too. So it made me feel more normal, I guess. And it was comforting to know that um that it wasn't just a weird reaction I was having. <laughs> it was uh this is normal, I guess. Yeah, I think um, you have to be ready to do something like a support group, but it can be really healing to talk to people who've had similar experiences and to feel that loss. Has there been anything else that's helped you heal in this process for you? It's Funny enough, just telling people that I was pregnant once. So the chances that I've had to speak with um, women who are pregnant, you know, you make small talk with those with people. And if they're pregnant and you say things like, oh, how far along are you? And how are you feeling? Um, and they always say something like, oh, I'm really tired or, you know, fill in the blank pregnancy symptom here. Um, and then I would say something. I felt this need to say something like, oh, yeah, I felt that too. Or... I know exactly what you mean. I had this issue in this situation too. And a lot of the women would say something back like, oh, you have a kid. Because I'm obviously not pregnant now. Like, how old's, how old's your kid? And then I say, no, I, I don't have a child. My baby died. And I realize that's kind of mean <laughs> in a way. Because you, you know that that other person's like, well, this is awkward. Like, why do we? But it helped me in a way. To just get it off my chest. And I don't know why. I don't know why it helped me to um, get it out in the open. I guess when I first started that job, no one knew I was pregnant. And I didn't want to tell anybody because um, I was going to have the baby before my probation period was up. So I didn't know whether I'd keep my job, you know. Um, so I didn't tell anybody that I was pregnant. And then, of course, when I lost the baby, it's not something you go around just being like, hey, everyone, <laughs> I lost my baby. <laughs> so um, so eventually a time came, though, that it felt really good to just have it out there. And I don't know why it felt good, but there was some sort of release in being able to say, like, I was pregnant once, and, um, but I lost my kid. I can't explain why, but... Um, Slowly, I started telling people that I worked with, the ones that I trusted. And it felt like a relief to have this story out and to have shared it. So that helped. And it was strange that it helped. Probably part of it, I'm a very um, extroverted person. I don't like secrets. <laughs> I don't like things to be held in. So that's probably part of it for me. It was... I guess therapeutic to be able to have it out and to not hold it in and hang on to the pain by myself anymore. It is a struggle sometimes to talk to people though because um 
people just assume that you have a miscarriage. And I'm a very truthful person and I don't like the record to not be straight. And it feels weird to let people go in thinking it's a miscarriage when it's not. I've kind of gotten over that. The issue is there's just so much taboo around abortion. And, you know, whatever your reasons are, they're your personal reasons. They're no one else's business. But you don't want to go around saying stuff like, I don't know. You don't want to go around saying things that are controversial and that upset people um, just for the sake of saying it, I guess. I don't know. I don't. Maybe other people do. I'm a people pleaser. I don't want to walk around saying things that people will potentially be up in arms about or judge me for or whatever. So people I've trusted, I've, the people I'm close to, I've told them, you know, the baby had a birth defect and we elected to terminate. And that wasn't so bad, but for most part, most people that I tell, I just say, well, we lost the baby, which we did. It's truth enough. Did you eventually name your child? I did. I did find a name for my son. Um, I mentioned earlier about the girl at the support group who made this sort of funny comment that you can name your kid whatever you wanted. And um, I kind of took that with me when I was making the decision. One name that kept rattling around in my head while I was pregnant was Nathan. So um, just around Mother's Day, I guess it was, I finally felt at peace enough to give the name Nathan. And um, Joe and I were no longer together, so I didn't feel like I needed to talk to him about it. Whereas, you know, when we were together, it's a name, it's a thing you pick out together, a name. Um, But that was one that that I had been thinking about and really cherishing while I was pregnant. And so I finally got to a point where I felt like it was time. And I can't really explain what it was that stopped me from naming him before. And maybe part of it was, I didn't, it was real, obviously it had happened, but maybe it made it too concrete to have a name before. And I got to a point where I was okay. And um, I was ready to give him a name. Not that, you know, you can talk to him or some people feel like you can talk to people that you've lost and but I needed to be able to talk about him and I needed to be able to refer to him. And it felt weird to say my son because people look around for the kid, right? And there's nobody there. So, um, but yeah, I really like the name Nathan and I like the nickname Nate. And uh, just for fun, I gave him a middle name of T-Rex because I really like Jurassic Park and I really like uh, the T-Rex and <laughs> I thought it would be really funny. I mean, kids have nicknames too and why not? Plus, like I said before, what are, what are people going to say? Like, oh, your baby died and you named him something weird. No one's going to say that to you. So I take a little bit of uh, amusement out of that, being able to say that. Um, in memory of him, Joe and I decided to plant a tree. We decided on an oak. Um, he's from Florida and I'm from Louisiana. And there's a lot of oak trees down there and they live for a really long time. We didn't want something that would potentially die. Like some people said plant flowers and stuff. Those maybe last a year. I don't want to deal with the death of a plant as well. <laughs> so, um, but we just haven't found a place to do that yet because we don't want to plant it where um, a tree's going to get mowed down or it's going to die or not be taken care of. Or worse, be in a place where we won't have access to it. So, or I guess I now won't have access to it. I want to be able to, like a grave. I, I, I never met my son. I never got to hold him. I never had a body. So I never had a... I couldn't bury him, you know, so this will be like a, a living reminder of him, some place I can go see. So um, I think it will end up being down in Louisiana for me. I'm not sure where Joe will end up planting his tree, but I think that's where I'll plant mine. And that's because that's where my family is. And I'll have a little plaque that says Nate T-Rex. <laughs> um, I guess the only tricky part about that is, you know, when people make a tombstone or a plate and memorial with people they put dates i don't know what dates i would put on there but maybe i don't need one i don't know but yeah so i guess that's the latest in the grieving process for me is finally being able to name him and be able to talk about it 
think he's the little person. Yeah. Mother's Day was really hard for me because people didn't acknowledge me as a mom. And I think for a lot of people, they didn't think about it because I didn't give birth, right? So are you really a mom? Um, my answer, of course, is yes. And um, I had, you know, just like all parents, had to make a really difficult decision for my kid. And unfortunately, that ended in his death. But um, I did make that decision, and I did it with a lot of love. And um, to have no one say anything to me at all in Mother's Day was really hard. And it made me really mad, actually. But there's no one specifically to be mad at because the people who did remember told me that they felt weird about it, like they weren't sure what to say and whether saying anything would make it more difficult for me. And so they were kind of doing it to be nice, I guess, not saying anything just to be. Um, but how, how would they have known that that's what I wanted to be acknowledged on that day? I think the grieving process is very different for, for different people. And um, I may not even feel the same way next year, you know, but Nathan was supposed to be born in March. So by May, I would have had a two month old. And um, so it's a lot more fresh. I don't know how I'm going to feel next year. Hopefully those I've told, you know, that it hurt, that they didn't acknowledge me. Hopefully those people will remember and say something to them. We all still feel the same way. Um, one thing I did do on Mother's Day, and I didn't tell you this before, is I went out and did something for myself that I would not be able to do if I was at home nursing a baby. So I went to Shake and Ease Festival, and uh, that was really awesome because I was walking around. I'm totally uninhibited. I don't have any responsibilities, and I could do whatever I wanted when I wanted, and I didn't have to worry about going home and nursing. So for me, that was um, a little bit healing to do that. Father's Day was hard because Joe and I were broken up. And so in addition to thinking about him being a dad and being the dad of my kid, I had to think about not being with him because we were going to have kids as soon as we got married. And um, so not only did I lose this kid, but I lost this father. So Father's Day was hard for me for that reason. Um, so I was, it was hard. It brought up feelings of, of loss, not only for Nathan, but also for Joe. <laughs> so that was really rough. I, I just want to be acknowledged as a mom. It's hard. It's just, it's hard enough to lose the baby, but then to have everyone to forget it immediately. It really hurt my feelings. So yeah, I think just being acknowledged would have been really healing for me. And I don't think it's the same for all people. I mean, some people have an abortion and they, they want to forget it and they want it behind them. And I don't know, maybe I'll feel that way one day. I don't think that I will. But, um, but I won't ever forget my son. And I don't want other people to forget. So I'm not saying like I need a big card or like a cake or something, but just a kind word. <laughs> would have been nice my aunt did acknowledge she she and my actually she and my uncle tried to have kids for years and they did everything and they were just never able to have kids and so my uncle texted me and he said just wanted you to know that we were thinking about you and um I just it meant a lot that they did say that and then when I did talk to my mom she she was sorry that she hadn't said anything but she just didn't want to say it and upset me or bring up anything that was too painful i just felt like my mom should have understood <laughs> but yeah i think that's all just wanted to know that it's not forgotten i guess another oh well there was one other thing i guess i hadn't said before it's very out of order but i'm the kind of person i don't I didn't want to tell anybody that I was pregnant until I knew that the pregnancy was going to stick, right? So we got into the second trimester and I was like, sweet. Because like most 
miscarriages happen in the first trimester. And so I got past that. I'm like, sweet. I tell everybody. And then, oh, damn, two weeks later. I mean, I told everybody. I was so excited. And then two weeks later, two weeks later, I was pregnant again. So then I had to send out another email to everybody. Calls, text message everybody. And just be like, ah, just kidding. <laughs> so that sucked. Um, that was really difficult. But we had a lot of very, um, very good responses from people. People were really sensitive and understanding about it. Some people came forward with their own stories, like children that they had lost. And um, what I really appreciated that people didn't offer a bunch of advice, like this is what you should do. There were enough people that recognized that grief is a very personal thing. It progresses differently for everyone and different things happen for different people. And so people were simply like, we're here for you. And, and one thing that we did, I mean, we did request that people not contact us for a little while because, I mean, I was a mess. I just started this new job and I just needed to keep it together. And if someone would even just, you know, a pregnant person just walk by, I would like lose it. So I certainly couldn't be talking about it. I just wasn't ready. Um, so I appreciated that people really gave me my space. And then the ones that did say something, they were very kind and understanding and no one tried to force anything on us like, what you really should be doing is this, or what you really should be doing is that. So I appreciated that a lot. So people were very sensitive. And some people sent cards. And you know, one thing, um, when when something like that happens in your life, um, you get this outpouring of support and love. But then a few weeks later, a month later, people kind of forget. And so one thing I was really pleased about is, you know, even a month on, we were still getting cards from people who just thought, even if it was just like a little small, it was just a small gesture, but it meant so much to have people just write like a little note. So that was nice. Um, but then again, came Mother's Day came and I felt like people forgot already, so that was kind of rough. But I think um, I think the people that matter know how I feel. Why do you want to share your story? I don't think it's fair that abortion is such a taboo topic. I don't think that it's um, rightly so. I know there's a lot of debate right now politically, um, pro-choice, pro-life, right? And there's a lot of um, men who get up there and they have this need to say something about how what women should do with their bodies. I don't think that's their place to say. You can have an opinion on it. But to make a decision for it, you know, about that, uh, it's not your fault you don't have a uterus, but you don't. And I don't think that it should be any man's decision. And to have the culture surrounding it be so built up by men is so unfair. I think the only way that we'll all be able to talk about it out in the open and be open about it is to start talking about it. You've got to start talking about it. So even though I think that um, most people, when they think of abortion, they think of just an unwanted child or something like that. And so maybe this is not quite the typical reason people get an abortion. It's an abortion nonetheless, and there are a lot of people who were of the opinion that I should have had the surgery, let the baby, you know, do what it's going to do and carry the child to term. There's a lot of people who felt like I should have done that. Um, I don't think that life is the end-all be-all. I think there are circumstances like in mine where if you have the choice to save somebody the pain, maybe you should. And um, that's why we chose to have an abortion. It's a really difficult decision to make. On the one hand, it's really easy because you're like, how could I do anything else? But on the other hand, it's really fucking hard. It's really fucking hard because you just want to meet your kid. <laughs> but um, again, I... it's a difficult decision. It's something that you should be able to talk to with other people. And it's something that people can't really talk about 
without there being a lot of controversy, without there being a lot of judgment, without there being a lot of political discussion. And there's just no place for a political discussion when it comes to a decision that you're making for yourself, for your family, for your health. Like, like I said, I think the, the first step is talking about it. You've got to start talking about it and you've got to do it a lot and you have to do it unapologetically um, until people stop feeling so uncomfortable. And maybe it's mainstream in a way. But there also needs to be understanding. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, you shouldn't get an abortion when you look at it on paper. But when you sit there and you actually talk to the person who's making that decision and you learn their story and you learn the circumstances surrounding it, there's a lot more humanity to it. I think there's a lot more understanding that's then garnered from that. But um, without hearing the story, you're just a number on a paper. So I also wonder if um, those protesters, if they sat down and actually had a open and understanding conversation with the people who were sitting in that waiting room, if they wouldn't change their minds. And so those protesters are probably not going to listen to your podcast, but maybe someone they know will. Maybe someone will say something to them. Kind of a big part of your pregnancy. Um, did you get support from your family? Did you tell them? I tell my mom everything. And I told both my parents. And my dad is... Um, He's Catholic and very religious, and he was 100% supportive. I knew my mom would understand, and I didn't think that my dad would be mean or anything about it, but I was afraid of what he would say when I said, I'm, I'm having an abortion. But he was, the first thing out of his mouth is, I think you're making the right decision. And I was really surprised, but also really relieved. Um, but yeah, they were totally supportive and they, they were behind me. They said, you are, you're making the right decision. It helped to know before I had made the decision that they also said, whatever decision you make will be the right one. And then once I made it, they still followed through. They, it wasn't just something they were saying to be nice. When I made the decision, they actually really did feel that I was making the right decision. and That helped to know that. I mean, I would have done it anyway, but to have my parents' support was, was really important to me. I don't know that I told the full story to anyone else at the time. I think it was just my parents. Since then, I have. How do you feel now that you've shared it with me? Oh, it's a podcast. How are you feeling? Um, it's kind of scary. <laughs> I hate that I cried a lot. <laughs> it's too hard to tell without crying, but uh, I don't know how it sounds when you don't see the person and you don't <laughs> have all of the body language, but um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I guess a little bit hopeful that it helps somebody else. It's a hard thing to go through. And um, with things like Facebook, like, Let's say you read something and you're like, hey, I'm looking for something. Like, I'm looking for a new place to live. And you put that online. And, hey, I'm going through this thing. Like, maybe someone can help me. You can put that online. But if you're trying to make a decision about abortion, you don't be like, hey, I'm trying to decide whether or not I should have an abortion. Like, anybody want to help out with that? You can't reach out. You cannot reliably reach out for that kind of help. And I know when I was making the decision, I felt isolated and the only thing that I had to look for were accounts online of other people who had been through what I'd been through, making the decision that I had to make. And I read the accounts of people who elected to terminate like I did, and I read through the accounts of the people who elected to go through with the pregnancy and have the surgery and all that kind of stuff. And it's people sharing their stories that connects everybody. And I, I feel really grateful that other people we're willing to do that, and I'm just hoping that through sharing my story, someone else will get something out of it, and also that it'll bring a easier, it'll bring the dialogue about abortion that needs to happen. It'll bring it out more into the public. Like it needs to be. So I guess hopeful.
but also a little bit scared. <laughs> but right now I feel really <laughs> like I'm in turmoil because I just had to live through it all again. Uh, when I first heard that you were doing this, it wasn't even a question. I was like, I need to reach out. I need to share the story. And I just, I felt like I really needed to do that. And so now I feel good about that. I feel good that I did that, that I went through with it, even though I knew that it was going to be hard. And I kind of dreaded a little bit having to go through it all. Because like I said, this is the first time in a very long time that I've told the whole story. So yeah, I feel really emotional right now because <laughs> it's a difficult story to tell. But I also feel like I did a really good thing. This is Melissa, your host and the founder of The Abortion Diary. For more information about The Abortion Diary podcast, visit us on the web at theabortiondiary.com or email me with your questions or comments at melissa at theabortiondiary.com. If you're a fan of the podcast and would like to help us reach more folks, please subscribe on iTunes and write a review or rate this podcast, even if it's not how you listen. Your reviews and ratings will help us grow in the iTunes rankings and reach more people. I would also love to hear from you. And you can also listen to over 150 abortion stories on our website, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, or your favorite podcast app. And the Abortion Diary can't continue without your support. I've been self-funding the Abortion Diary for over three years and need your help to continue to share our stories. Support the Abortion Diary by making a tax-deductible donation through Factored Atlas or becoming our patron on Patreon. You can also bring me to your college campus or organization I use the money generated from that to make more Abortion Diary episodes. If you would like to share your story, send me an email at melissa at theabortiondiary.com or visit our website, click on Share Your Abortion Story, and fill out our contact form. I'm currently in Ohio and look forward to visiting your city or town soon. Thank you to Karen and Scott for hosting me in Atlanta, Georgia, so I could record this story. If you would like to host me in your city or town, please send me a message. And thanks to you for listening. I'll be back next week with a new story.